This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. You know, I think when I reflect on these cases I'm going to show you, it's a, it, it actually, they're very challenging but very rewarding. But the other thing I noted in these patients when I looked back after my 11-year experience now, I think it shaved about five years off my life with uh, stress. But um, so our role in limb salvage, you know, we'll talk a little bit about limb salvage, and you know, I, well, I'll talk a little bit about the the vascular insufficiency part of it, but also I see a lot of limb salvage from trauma and uh, from orthopedic surgeons as well. But we continue to push the envelope, and every week it amazes me uh, the cases, and these are just a a group of cases from the past month from my practice that I get sent to me with bigger and bigger, they just keep getting bigger and bigger, the wounds that uh, are sent to me. This is probably the granddaddy of them all um, when I get called into a room to say, oh yeah, could we, uh, could we salvage these extremities? And this was a 85-year-old guy who was dragged behind a muni bus for a couple blocks and uh, you know, obviously there are some cases we can't salvage so what's my role? I think of it, you know, and honestly, the, the intro with all the talks this morning have been great because, you know, and I'm not, I may skip over that stuff and talk about flaps today, but really all that stuff is very important. Dr. Rothenberg's talk was excellent regarding wound and all the, the medical management of the wounds and how we care for the wounds because that's all been a lot of, there have been a lot of strides in those areas lately. Um, and I think the team effort is success at UCSF. I mean, I can't underscore enough you know, all these people on the team, I mean, they're all far brighter than I am. They see these patients, and, you know, usually when it comes to me, they're ready for a flap. So the indications are expanding, as I mentioned. I mean, a lot of things are changing with our wound debridement strategies, our, you know, our orthopedic surgeons, our tissue-friendly uh, uh, fracture fixation techniques, antibiotics. I'll talk a little bit about some of the microsurgical advances that we've had, and I think we keep pushing the envelope there, and improvements in wound management. Like, like I said, I think some of the biggest improvements lately have really been in that pre-flap stage of wound management. So the considerations from a plastic surgery standpoint, you know, the location, I'll kind of focus on the uh, lower extremity today, but whereabouts on the extremity is the wound. Um, and what I need to fill that wound. The size of the defect is important in the components. Is it a bony defect? You know, what's the status of the blood vessels, the nerves, the sensation? And then obviously in my patient population, you know, I think everybody comes with multiple comorbidities with an advanced age and then obviously the mechanism, whether it's traumatic or some type of uh, vascular compromise. In general, the, the management is very important because it's not just orthopedics or vascular or podiatry doing the debridements, but I think doing it together, assessing the defect, because I think one of the biggest failures that I see in patients that come back to me are inadequate debridements. They need to be debrided, continue till it's clean. I think negative pressure has made another big impact in my practice. It's been, you know, I never consider in my practice negative pressure is not a, a modes of cure of the wounds that I treat, but it certainly can be used as a bridge. And then with all this data that we have together as a team, we can decide whether it's going to be an amputation, whether we can do limb salvage, or preservation of length, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But obviously, in a vascular symposium, it, you know, it really comes down to the inflow. I mean, I could do whatever flap, either a local rotational flap or free flap, but if there's, no, if there's not a good inflow to that area, it's going to fail. So debridement. So here's a patient that I had showed early on. A patient. This is another patient who had been who was dragged behind a car after being hit. And you know we can't we cannot assess this wound until it's adequately debrided. Again, multiple services: orthopedic, podiatry. We all we all take this patient to the operating room together. We debride it until it's da down to a nice, clean, healthy base. If it's a, ten a necrotic tendon or a vessel or a nerve, if it's dead, it's got to go. We got to get this this patient debrided to healthy tissue. What we're trying to avoid in this diabetic patient who comes in with a wound that's been undermanaged, not aggressively managed, I should say, and then they, you know, then they come on, they get pus going up to the leg, and this patient ultimately uh, underwent a, a below the knee amputation. So we're trying to get, we're trying to breed these adequately in a team fashion to get these patients treated. 
So when I look at a wound, the reconstructive ladder is a big term in plastic surgery, and it's, it really helps me talk to my colleagues and to the patient as well, because really, I think of every case that I do, I teach the residents, we want to start simple and move to complex in a ladder kind of fashion. You know, we, down in the lower rungs of the ladder, we have direct closure, skin grafts, local flaps, and then microsurgical transfer. I think I put down here in the slide, I think negative pressure and skin substitutes have been an addition over the past few years to our, our reconstructive ladder. And as I mentioned again in a quick talk about negative pressure, again, it's, it's you know, in, in complex or simple wounds, it's been a great bridge to treatment. In the upper extremity, we use negative pressure as well, again, in decloving injuries, in, in patients who've had bad open wounds, uh, negative pressure I think has allowed us, and we have a paper coming out soon, to, to lengthen our, our flap coverage. So in the lower rungs of the ladder, so a patient with an open foot wound, again, we work with podiatry, vascular surgery, orthopedic surgery. We have good blood, we have good inflow. We correct all the patient comorbidities. A simple Integra skin graft works great. I like to stage my Integra by a couple weeks. You place a skin graft to get good healing. Another case here, open dorsal foot wound. Again, a large wound. Some exposed tendon, but good granular, granular base after wound back therapy. We can treat this with an Integra stage with a skin graft to get good coverage. Now, as we move up the ladder from our standard skin grafts to local flaps, we can think about local flaps, our regional flap, or distant flap as we move up the ladder. We can also think about how we use the muscle. Do we take the muscle with a skin island? Do we take the muscle, then put a skin graft on the muscle? And then we have perforator flaps, which I'll touch on towards the end. So here's another local flap option, a patient who has uh, a diabetic patient who had an injury with an Achilles tendon, had surgery, the wound breaks down. I've seen many, many of these wounds. It's a very, very difficult area. You can't just put a skin graft on it. And also with comorbidities, you know, even though we can move up to a free flap, a lot of times now, especially in my advanced age, I, I try to save doing free flaps. But in you know, simple things like a random pattern flap, we can mark these flaps out, we can respect local blood supply, design these flaps, and disadvance these simply over. So instead of an eight-hour operation, a one-hour operation, we can advance that local flap over. We can kind of rob Peter to pay Paul and skin graft the donor site. And I've had great success with these patients. And again, in elderly patients, comorbidities, it works very nicely. As we move on to a little bit more flaps, see these uh, lateral de defects here, lateral plantar artery flap has been ver very versatile for these small defects. You can Doppler out this vessel, you can elevate this flap, rotate it over, skin graft the donor site, and these do very well. Another example, lateral plantar artery flap, you can design these flaps, rotate them over, and skin graft the donor site with good coverage. Now, as the wounds get bigger with more exposed, you know, of course, as we all know, I mean, we, of course, we treat this patient with wound care, but as, you know, we have, we need to get everything out that's not alive, and now we've got exposed bone. We can design Vita Y advancement flaps in the, on the plantar aspect of the foot, and these, I, these work great. There's an example. Here's a Charcot example. We saw one earlier today. And again, a bilateral Vita Y advancement flap on that to get good stable coverage. Now, one, this is a cleaner wound than some of the wounds I'll show you, and whether wound care would be appropriate over the long term for healing, I'm not sure, but this provides great stable coverage. I put this in here for completeness sake. You've, you've probably heard about the Searle flaps. We can design this. This is a kind of a reverse flow flap on the back of the, uh, the lower leg. In my hands, not a, I haven't had great success with this flap. They, they uh, get very venous congested. The vascular supply is tenuous, especially in these patients with a lot of comorbidities. And now this has kind of been supplanted in my practice with microsurgery. But again, a great option. You see the donor site there in the back leg, which we skin graft, but a great option for heel wounds. Another smaller wound here, which has been treated, you see here on the right with a sural flap. So I'll spend the last part kind of talking about microsurgical reconstruction because that really is where my practice is. I do about 200 free flaps a year in my practice. Um, so we do a lot of microsurgery and I think, you know, with a good microsurgical team, you can get good results. 
kind of like the, this is the angiosome. I love the woundosome concept that was brought up earlier. I, I, mean, I may steal that concept, but the, Dr. Taylor, a plastic surgeon, has really kind of expanded the plastic surgery flap armamentarium. I mean, we can take a flap literally now from anywhere of the body based on a blood supply to cover a certain defect. And as we've moved forward in our reconstructions, we, we've really tried to minimize our donor sites. So limb salvage, and a lot of times it's not the whole limb, but it's, it's salvaging length of a limb. Here's a guy who was taken out, he was standing at an ATM, taken out by a taxi cab. You can see he's got an above the knee on the right and a, and a through the knee on the left. But again, with, with a team approach, we thought, well, saving length on that left side would be important. Even more importantly, he had also had a femur fracture on that side, so going above the knee would be difficult. You can see here on the right side, there may have been a little iatrogenic injury from orthopedic colleagues into the vessels there with their external fixator. So it, made the, it actually made the, the, the reconstruction very complicated. We used a rectus abdominis musculocutaneous flap, which we had to do a big vein loop from the upper portion of his uh, thigh down to the knee to provide a nice, stable, bulky coverage to keep that through the knee amputation. And this is him. He is now about nine years out, and he's doing great, able to walk in this prosthetic. This is a more challenging case. This is a, a young guy, motorcycle police officer, who's thrown from his motorcycle. Again, multidisciplinary approach. I was actually called initially to replant the leg, but obviously it was not replantable. And you see he's got a below the knee, but a, a large exposed tibia. Again, it would be harder to go higher on him with his amputation. We wanted to maintain him below the knee because he also had a femur fracture as well. You see, he also had some blood supply to his tibia there, so we thought maybe we can take a muscle flap and wrap around that tibial defect to maintain a below the knee length. And again, a very difficult case. We had to do a big vein loop down to the flap. We essentially wrapped the flap around the tibia. And then he also is about eight years out now. We did some revisions, as you can see. Great function, we maintained a below the knee, and he's back to his life. Here's a complicated case I did with Dr. Eichler now 11 years ago, actually my first year in practice. A patient who had a tumor removed from her lower extremity, she was offered an amputation elsewhere. She had very poor inflow to her leg. She came to me to try to do a limb salvage procedure. Dr. Eichler did a, a bypass graft um, to her lower extremity. I took, a, I took a muscle flap off of her bypass graft, um, which was actually a cryovane, which I don't know if that's ever been published, but she's now 11 years out. I actually just saw her about a couple months ago for other reasons, but she's doing great. So we've salvaged this leg. She's 11 years out, and I took this flap off of the bypass graft. Kind of more complicated here. This patient had not only a big bony injury, a vascular injury, big vascular reconstruction, and again, limb salvage. So big defect. You see a big bony defect there with antibiotic beads. We use the latissimus muscle flap to place over the muscle. The orthopedic team did a bone transport after the vascular team did the vascular reconstruction, and we salvaged that leg as well. Here's a complicated case. This is a patient that came in, had a free flap about 15 years ago for um, osteomyelitis. Again, had poor inflow to the lower extremity, probably was, which is why she broke down, had this big open wound, came to me with this continued open defect with a, a free flap sitting right next to it. Well, this kind of underscores some of their microsurgical techniques. She didn't have, did not have a good receptor vessel for me to plug the new free flap into. I was able to dig out a perforator vessel from her previous latissimus flap to plug into her rectus abdominis flap. And you can see this is kind of pushing the envelope. This is probably a three to one size mismatch at a probably a one millimeter vessel. But you know, again, this kind of underscores how we're able to kind of push the envelope with microsurgery. Again, another devastating injury here, poor vascular inflow on a, on a, on a diabetic patient with a bad infection. All the principles kind of took place in this patient. You know, team approach, adequate debridement, soft tissue management, stage it with wound care. I like to use silver dressings for um, for some time, even under the negative pressure dressings, get it clean, latissimus, free flap for foot salvage. Here's a case, I think, I don't know if Dr. Conti was involved in this case with myself and Dr. David Young, again, a bad heel ulcer. Uh, this is a limb salvage case. The Vassar team did a, um, 
a bypass graft down to the dorsalis pedis graft. Uh, we see the wound here. This is a flap that I, just, I described about 12 years ago. And again, minimizing donor site. I can take a flap now from the body just based on veins, superficial veins. We can do what we call a venous flow through flap and plug the artery into, the, into one vein into another artery on the other side of the flap. So we used a forearm vein on this patient from the arm, a vein only flap. You can see the, the, uh, the vein trajectory there. We can plug this, we plug this into the bypass graft and then into the outflow of the foot to provide coverage and limb salvage of this complicated heel wound. Again, heel reconstruction, we can use muscle flaps, getting to the end here, my time is running short, but I can use muscle flaps to the heel. Sometimes I've used perforator flaps and I've used skin grafts, which do not provide good durable coverage. Here's a case of a, a crushing injury of a woman, again, underscoring the concept of limb salvage or, or uh, stump salvage, actually. After debridement, again, with negative pressure, wound care. Here's her angiogram, oh, sorry. And we can use a latissimus flap to kind of resurface the foot to maintain that length of her, of her amputation stump and get her healed. So the recipient vessels are always the issue. I mean, you know, I can take the I can take flaps off perforating vessels now. I usually go end to side to, you know, because I don't want to take any of the, the blood flow to the foot, especially in these complicated patients. Uh, I can take about take it off the bypass graft. I, I've been using a lot of vessels around the knee lately, the superior medial geniculate vessels, and doing vein loops for uh, for reconstruction. So in summary, I think team approach is, is obviously the utmost importance. We use the reconstructive ladder. I think the initial soft tissue management is critical with the team approach. We wanna make sure we debride all that tissue that's not viable. We wanna address the inflow, the bone issues, and then we can proceed with our flap. Thank you.